Hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am Mike Marsh, your host. You can find me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn or ResearchGate, but be sure to check out the YouTube channel. You can find it at orss.ca slash ytp2. That's where you can go to find this playlist with this Dragonfly Daily and all of the other Dragonfly Dailies. So we are back again. Today's topic, lesson 30. Can you believe that? Three, the big 3 three decades of lessons. Well, 30 lessons in a month and a half or five weeks, however long this uh, pandemic has been going on. Lesson 30 will address the topic Python console and script runner. If you're watching this live, you'll be able to participate in the give and take, including the questions at the end. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and also give us a like to let you know the, to let us know that you like this content and you want more on customization and Python content for Dragonfly video content on YouTube. Now, um, just as a reminder, this is Lesson 30, Python Console and Script Runner. It fits in this week, which is addressing customization and automation in Dragonfly. We've already had two lessons on macros, the Macro Player, which allows you to play back macros, but also record macros, the Macro Builder, which is featured in Lesson 29. It allows you to use the different building blocks and build together your own customized macro that's easy to edit and, of course, easy to share, and it is played with the same Macro Player discussed in Lesson 28. Today's topic will show you how to interactively work with your Dragonfly session on the console, but also interact with it um, with a tool called Script Runner. Then in the following two lessons, we will describe developer tools for Dragonfly, and we'll also create an example where we go from beginning to end and create some sort of useful tool. I'll figure that out before lesson 32. So a bit of housekeeping before we get into today's content. First, um, uh, how many of you did your homework? Raise your hand. I want to know how many people uh, decided there would be some sort of macro that could be useful for me to show. Excellent. So, well, not excellent. Hmm. I may have to call some parents here. We only had uh, uh, five people uh, do their homework, but I didn't assign a due date. So maybe I should say your homework is due tomorrow and then we'll get better participation. So you can go ahead and lower your hands. Um, what I will have you do now is if you did come up with an idea, you wrote one to two sentences on a macro that you think would be useful to see, go ahead and paste that into the question and answer block. So paste it as a question, your one to two sentences of what you think would be a useful macro. Then uh, towards the end, when we go into the questions and answers, we will let people vote up the ideas and we'll take votes today and we'll take votes again tomorrow. And then we'll take whatever gets a lot of votes and create a Dragonfly daily lesson around creating that macro. So if, you, if you're one of the six people that raised your hand, go ahead and take your two to three sentences that you wrote and paste it into a question. Now, the next topic here in, in housekeeping is um, we had mentioned last week briefly the idea of opening up a bone segmentation collaboration and also the idea of discussing graph enhancements for Dragonfly and getting feedback from the user community. Now, I had initially said that we would have the bone segmentation discussion uh, today um, in about 50 minutes from now. I did not schedule that. And I think what I will do is send an email to everyone who is registered for the live webinar. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to be included and be able to participate in either the bone segmentation collaboration or the graph and graph enhancements discussion, please register. You can register at orss.ca slash daily r. That's D-A-I-L-Y R with a capital R. And then you can register just like all the people who are watching live. And if you register for that, then I will send you an invitation that you could choose to participate in the discussion about the bone segmentation or the graph and graph enhancements discussion, which I expect to happen about one week from today. So around, I don't know, May 20th. All right. Now, uh, thank you for all of that. So sorry it's not going to happen today, but we'll get those issues. I do also have lots of emails from those of you who want to collaborate with Bones, so I have your contact information. I will be sure to include you in that invite. Also, a thank you to Dr. Matthew Gendron at ORS who helped me with some of the content for today. So today's content, I am fairly out of my comfort zone. I don't really do any Python development. I haven't done Python programming since I programmed my TEM you know, uh, 15 or 20 years ago to collect tilt series. That was a long time ago. So I don't really do Python development, but that's my job today is to teach you Python development and Dragonfly. So thanks to Matthew to helping prepare me. We also have Matthew on the call. He should be able to answer the questions that you guys ask that are uh, beyond my expertise. Now, 
Um, having said that, let's dive into Lesson 30, Python Console and Script Runner. As always, it will be done with Dragonfly 4.1. There are customizations shown in the Dragonfly Daily Lesson 6 customizing Dragonfly, so the user interface may look a little different, but I think it will be completely inconsequential for today's lesson. We will talk about the Python Console and Script Runner, so maybe that heading is a little misleading. So we will talk about the Interactive Console first. Oh gosh, I wrote that we're using Anaconda 3.1 Python, and then I didn't go back and check and see what we're actually using. So that'll be the first thing I'll do is we'll pull up and you'll see exactly what version of Anaconda we're using and exactly what version of Python we're using. You're going to see that in the interactive console, you have access to all of the objects in your session. You can create new objects. You have the benefit of tab completion and doc strings for the methods and functions that you'll want to use. And you have the luxury of being able to drag and drop for accessing your ORS objects and views. You'll see what I mean shortly. Then we'll talk about a different tool called Script Runner that allows you not only to test your code, but it's easier to edit your code and it's automatically stored. You don't have to hit the save button and you're able to store and recall code. That is a feature you do not enjoy when you're working on the console. So you'll see here what we call the code preparation, which is a place where code gets executed once, even if you're running in this repetitive mode. Then you'll see predefined variables and variables that you can assign with drag and drop. Then you'll see the main code block and finally the output block where you can view a variable called result. I know none of that makes any sense yet because we haven't done the lesson, but that's just an outline of where we're going. Now, with that said, let's go over to Dragonfly. I meant to load a data set. I don't have a data set loaded, but um, I will, gosh, which data set do I want to load? I'm going to load this data set, which is uh, a three and a half gigabyte bone data set shared to me, shared with me from uh, Carl Jepson and Rob Goulet at the University of Michigan. You don't need any data loaded for this lesson. It's just going to make it a little bit easier uh, for me to show something useful. Um, I don't have an attribution uh, that I show on screen because I didn't really plan exactly what data I'm going to use today. But thank you to uh, Dr. Carl Jepson and Dr. Rob Goulet there at University of Michigan. So we'll have the data loaded in just a moment. Okay, the blue progress bar is closing in and it is done. I do have a data set loaded. I'm going to go to the main track mode and I'm going to double click. So I've got my four view layout and I think I'm actually going to use, uh, does it matter? Um, I don't think it matters. Uh, I'm going to use this view. And now I'm going to start by um, going to Tools Python Console. All right. If you go to Tools Python Console, you have this console. To make it a little easier for you to read, I'm going to click the plus size a few times to increase the font size. Now, here is a Python console. Now, it tells you that I'm using Python 3.6.5. If you go to Help About Dragonfly, you will see that we are using. Uh, Anaconda Python, Python 3.6.5. I may be looking in the wrong place. I know it used to say what version of Anaconda. Uh, let's look one more about, mm, about Dragonfly. Nope, I guess I don't have it there. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll just have to know what version of uh, Dragonfly we're using. Maybe one of my colleagues will chime in and tell us what version of Anaconda we're using. Okay, now I have this console and I can type Python commands, uh, you know, boring commands like hello world. And you can see that I can see the doc string as soon as I open up the parentheses. So I can type Python. Now, we can obviously assign variables and we already have the import statements for a lot of the ORS object model. What that means is if I wanted to create a new channel, a new image channel, I could just call the channel constructor and I have a new channel. Now, you'll notice many things, or maybe you'll notice things that aren't happening, so I don't see my channel over on my list, but there are methods associated with the channel, such as I could start typing P-U-B. If I hit tab, you'll see I get line completion, and I can then hit the down cursor, or sorry, hit tab again, and then I could uh, select this, and it finishes the command. I could hit the open parentheses and I say, ah, oh, this is the, the command to set this object as representable and notify the Dragonfly UI of a new available object. I hit publish and now we see uh, channel 77 appears up here. All right, so we can create objects, we can publish them to the user interface. You might want to do things that are useful. So I might say channel.setTitle my first Dragonfly image. And now, if you look up here, you will see that it has not changed and there is sort of a delayed mechanism for a lot of things that are happening in Dragonfly. Oh gosh, uh, everyone says the video is lagging. Is there anything we can do to fix that? I could slow down. Hmm. 
well, uh, it'll be painful for those of you watching live. Uh, I will resume and I'll go a little bit slower. Uh, all right. Now, um, over in my screen over here, you see that as soon as I moved my mouse inside the properties panel, the title updated. So Dragonfly knows as soon as I'm over here, it should look to see if there have been any updates to these objects that it needs to display. And so it updated dynamically. If on the console, I choose to set the title again and I call it updated title, then you know what, we're going to, let's see, I'm gonna stop the video share and restart the video share in hopes that that gives everyone a better refresh. So I'm gonna stop share and we will share screen again and share. Hopefully Zoom will catch everybody up. I am sharing my screen again. And I typed my channel, set title, updated title. Now, if I hit return, it has an updated title. It doesn't show up in that view right away. As I mentioned, I could move my mouse over the Dragonfly properties and settings panel would update. I could also notify Dragonfly by basically notify every object in Dragonfly that's paying attention to new channel. I could say set title, I'm sorry, I could say set property dirty. And what this does is this fires an event so that everything that's paying attention to channel knows that it has had an update that has not been forced refresh in the user interface. Now, if I hit the enter now, you will see that it says updated title in the upper right. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is every object in the Dragonfly workspace has a global unique identifier. And by object here, I'm talking about things that implement what we call the ORS object model. And that means your images and your ROIs and your multi ROIs and your graphs and your, uh, your captions or your, your overlays, your shapes, all of those things have a global unique identifier. So at any time you could say new channel dot get global unique identifier and you would have it. That is something you could use to refer to that particular channel. Now, in reality, you're probably never going to type this command. And the reason is if I wanted to refer to an existing ORS object, I could just say uh, my channel equals, and then I can come up here and drag this. And as I drag it and drop it, it invokes a method called ORS object with, and it passes as an argument, the string that is its global unique identifier. Now I have a reference to this image channel that I loaded with the regular user interface. So I can say my channel and I could type tab and I could see all these different commands or I could type dir my channel and I can see all the commands. I can type uh, length on dir my channel and see I've got, I don't know, 807 commands I could learn how to master with my channel. The whole point is the global unique identifier references that channel and at any time you can get access to a reference to that, to that with the ORS OBJ method where you pass as a string the argument that is that global unique identifier. Now um, I'm going to proceed to discuss a little more on this image channel. Before I do, I just want to mention that I have defined in here, I can, uh, you see I, just, I defined something called new channel. Um, I could delete this in my workspace but it is not deleted. It is still consuming resources because there is still a reference to it. So if you're a Python developer, you know that the proper behavior here is to say new channel equals none to clear up that reference. So I just want to point that out as a useful tip. You want to free up memory by removing all references to objects that you're no longer using. Now, I just defined uh, my channel as a reference to the channel that I've already loaded in my workspace. Now, let's do some things with it. I could, uh, if you're here, you're probably a Python programmer, and if you're a Python programmer, you're probably already using NumPy. So maybe you would like to get the NumPy array. So you have access to the NumPy array, and you can start to interact with it. So I could say, uh, you know, I could do something like my channel dot get numpy array or get n dimensional array. And then I might say, you know what, let's set every other voxel in Y and every other voxel in Z and every other voxel in X and set it equal to zero. Now, what I have done is I have changed the intensity in my image but I do have to send a set data dirty signal so that the software knows that it has been updated. Now, um, you can now see that it automatically updated the window leveling to see this big peak of zeros over here. If I go here and I update the view, you can see now every other voxel 
so I have this screen door effect. Every other voxel has been set to zero. This means that you can access all of your methods in NumPy and SciPy and SciPy, uh, SciKit image, for example, to start doing image processing, interactively test those operations and see the results on the images in your workspace. Now you have an environment that can behave very much like a MATLAB environment where you can test out and prototype different functions directly on the console and see the result. And you can see it in 2D or 3D or do oblique slicing as well. So now you have this super rich environment for prototyping and testing out different Python options. Now we can also do uh, try and do something useful or do some computations. So suppose I wanted to interrogate this array of pixels and I wanted to know what is the mean intensity by slice of this data set. We could compute the mean intensity on one slice or on all slices in a loop. Um, that would be a very simple operation. So I could define a list called Z means the mean intensity on every slice. So we'll define a list. Now, um, let's suppose I wanted to compute the mean. I might want to use the NumPy uh, method np mean. So I'll import NumPy as np, and now I'll just do a simple loop. So I'll say for, uh, for z in range, and I might say uh, my channel dot get z size, and then I could say z means, and then append on every cycle of this iteration. I could append my uh, my get nd array and get the zth slice uh, but that's not what I want I actually want to do the mean so I'll do np.mean and then I'll put that uh, slice as an argument and now if I hit enter and enter now it's executing over every slice I've got 2,000 slices so now if I ask for z means there it's got the mean intensity on every slice now if we were then to Let's say uh, we were interested in plotting the z-means. You might want to look at it more than just data. You may want to look at the plot. Then we could do something like import matplotlib as, uh, or from, I'll do this, from matplotlib import uh, pyplot as plot. Whoops, what did I do? Uh, pyplot as plot. Now I could say plot and then invoke the plot method on z-means and ask plot to show and there I have the mean intensity and it's going uh, uh, up and down basically half I've got the intensity at, at some slices and then every other slice it's it's dropping down so the the plot is zooming is is going up and down so anyway we're looking at a at a plot so <laughs> high intensity low intensity high intensity and that's of course because I decimated the data by doing that screen door effect so you could do plots interactive plots you can do interactive programming we're not going to explore everything you can do in SciPy or NumPy I don't even know what you can do in those tools just want to show you that you can access the data structures you can access the codes for uh, SciPy NumPy you can access the codes for things such as matplotlib now um, let's do a, another example. Let's suppose I were to um, create an ROI. So I'm going to go to segment and I'm going to create a new, uh, create an ROI. And over here it's called ROI2 and I can get a reference to, uh, let's call it R, get a reference to ROI just by dragging in this. And now I have a reference to the ROI. And maybe I want to have a shape. So let's say I have a shape and we'll go back to main and we will create a shape uh, oh oh it's up here at the top let's create a capsule i've got a capsule and i'll uh, this will be my shape so i'll just uh, invert here and let's turn on the capsule so we can see it we can see it in that view uh, yeah let's look at it in this view so i've got this capsule and i can change its diameter and i can change uh, its length and its control points now let's say i wanted to uh, paint with this shape now I can, of course, paint with a shape into an ROI, and uh, oh, I haven't hit enter. Now um, there are commands for this, so I could uh, I could say uh, ROI uh, dot paint shape 3D, and we'll look in a few minutes at where all these methods and commands are defined. And I could say uh, shape dot get capsule zero. That's time point zero, and uh, do something like this and now I could do uh, set data dirty and I believe it has painted the ROI oh what did I do wrong let's see uh, paint shape 3d shape mm hmm Oh, there it is. I looked away and I looked back and it was painted. Anyway, um, so you might do this. 
And But let's say you're doing an experiment and you want to do it again. Well, I don't want to have to type uh, this command again and this command again, or maybe I keep changing things. So we're now going to move from what you might do in the console to what you might do in the, uh, in the script runner. Now, before we do that, uh, we're going to pause and take a moment from our sponsors. So here's your first commercial break interruption. It's the only commercial for today. Just want to remind everyone that uh, if you are using Dragonfly and you're either using a commercial version of Dragonfly because you have a general use license of Dragonfly or Dragonfly Pro, or you're using a non-commercial license, if you are uh, maintaining your maintenance and support plan, then you get the technical support, which means you have access to my team and the people behind me who make the software great to give you that product support. So what I want you all to ask yourselves is if you're sitting in this meeting, how many of you are doing some work that is funded by grant research? Raise your hand. Uh, anybody, anybody doing grant funded research? Look at that. The hands are shooting up. Um, what I am suggesting to you is the next time you are applying for a new cycle of funding, you should add Dragonfly maintenance and support to that grant proposal. So you can add it at different tiers and by getting Dragonfly funded, uh, you can pay for Dragonfly support when you have the funding. So the key takeaway here is Dragonfly is free for you to use and you know that you're going to be able to always use the latest version and stay up to date if you're a non-commercial user. But if you want that support, you can help contribute back to Dragonfly by paying the support when you do have the funding. So just as a reminder, the maintenance support means you get updates to the latest version, you get telephone and email support, and you're always able to migrate your license uh, when you upgrade hardware. For the non-commercial users, you also have access to share a single license key for everyone in your group. So you tell us how many people are in your group. I think there's maybe a limit at 10, but something like that. So you get a single license key. You don't have to apply for a license. Each person applying for a different license, having a different license key. Um, you also get access to the Dragonfly Cloud feature. And coming soon, you'll have a, a spot where you can, the more support you buy, the more votes you get where you're able to vote for product enhancements and influence our product roadmap. There are multiple teams of support so you can if you're applying for a higher level of funding and you, instead of just getting a few thousand dollar two or three thousand dollars of funding for dragonfly a year if you want to get closer to the ten thousand dollar level then you could include on-site training or funded development so all of that is possible you can keep using dragonfly when you don't have funding but when you do have funding you can send us a check and make sure that you're getting the support and you make sure the product is getting better so if you're using a general use license and you want to get up to date if you're using a non-commercial license and you want to get that benefit of support then email sales at theobjects.com all right, now back to our regularly scheduled program, which is Python console and script runner. So before we took the break, we had used the Python console to do a little uh, um, operation. And I said we could do these same sort of operations from script runner and do them more, let's say, iteratively or rep repeatedly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to tools and I am going to go to script runner, sorry, developer, and I will go to script runner. So just as a note, Python console appears for now under the tools menu and script runner appears under the developer menu. Script runner opens up this uh, tool. I'm going to click the plus button. This is automatically created a new script and it has today's timestamp as the date. What you see in this interface are four blocks, something called code preparation, something called predefined variables, main code, and output. Now, what we could do is we could type our code in here. It will be saved as soon as you type it, and we can continue to change it and keep running it, but we have a saved buffer or a saved state of code. Now, we could do something like we, we just did. We could create our my ROI, and we could add the shape, and we could paint, but we could do more interesting things. So if I take my ROI, maybe I'm going to type some commands here with a, a useful uh, macro my colleague demonstrated for me. And so I'm going to type those commands in. Uh, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my existing ROI and I'm going to clear it. Then the next thing I'm going to do is just like we saw in the console, I'm going to say let's paint shape 3D and let's take my capsule in this case and we'll get capsule at time step zero and we'll pass the necessary arguments one and zero to paint with that capsule. Then I can call my ROI.setData30 and now we have a a little piece of code that is defined. Now, I could say at the very beginning, I could say uh, my ROI equal and call that ORS object method and I could pass in the global unique identifier. That's one option here. However, we can actually define a variable that we intend to reuse. So I'm gonna click the plus button three times because I'm actually gonna predefine three variables. First one is gonna be my ROI. Second one is going to be my capsule. And the third one is going to be my channel. 
Now, um, all I have to do to make this work is take this ROI and deposit it right here. And now I have a reference to that ROI. So every time my ROI is invoking an object method, it is going to reference this ROI. Now I've also defined capsule, so I'll put it right here. Now I have this little piece of code. So if I were to, let's uh, select the capsules, um, now I can uh, reposition it. I'm going to close my console for now. Now, if I run this code, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, all right, so I have not defined my channel, so let's go ahead and define my channel. Now, if I run this piece of code, uh, all right, my ROI, clear ROI, my ROI paint uh, uh, shape 3D, my ROI dot set data dirty. Now, um, let's see, is there anything else I want to do? That looks good. And, ah, mm, Matthew's giving me a tip here. Piece of code I should put in here. And this is probably why it didn't update until I, I ran it. So now I'll do my ROI refresh all parent views. And I'll hit play button and there it goes. Now I can uh, select the capsule and I could move it. You know, this this purple and purple is, is not working out for me. So let's make this a uh, yellow. Uh, now I can move the ROI and I can hit play and I don't have to type the commands again. So I can uh, move the ROI and hit play and each time it's going to clear the ROI, paint the shape and do set data dirty uh, to tell Dragonfly that things need to be updated and then refresh all parent views. So that's working out quite nicely. Now let's suppose I want to do something more interesting. Let's suppose I want to overwrite the data. So let's say I want to come in here and I want to say my channel dot overwrite value with uh, ROI. So this is very much like the overwrite method we've used on ROI tools before. I could pass this my ROI and I could pass it do, 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 zero. So we'll overwrite with a value of zero. And I will do my channel dot set data dirty. And now if I, let's uh, put it right here and I hit play, it will, if we hide the ROI, oh look, it completely deleted what was in the ROI. And I could hit play again and it deleted again. So not deleted, but overwrote with zero. Now this gives us the capability of running the code every time we hit the play button. We could also turn on the this button, which will repeatedly run the code and it will get triggered based on the trigger conditions here. So if I do use handle triggered, basically every time I'm moving the mouse inside the view window, the code will execute again. So if I click this button and I come over here and I start dragging, well, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna make this smaller so it's a little more interactive. So let's do this, zoom in and do this. Now, if I would do once again and I, I play, you can see that I can now drag this and uh, yeah, it doesn't look too fluid. Probably if I ran it in the XY view or if I just make it even smaller, it's a pretty big data set. Let's turn off the uh, interactive, uh, the repeated triggering once more and And so now I can move my capsule and it will trigger. So a little bit slow uh, when you're trying to overwrite such a large data set over time with the ROI. But you see that I can uh, paint or overwrite. So this gives me the opportunity to run a macro and to run it repeatedly and to run it with these variables. Now, uh, I will turn off the uh, refresh button. I will note that when you are in the repeat mode, you do not have the option of changing any of the code. You have to turn off the repeat mode before you can change code. And we can always run it uh, a single iteration uh, over and over again. So we can continue to do something like this and hit the play button. All right, now this shows us that we can uh, use the script runner to invoke. So uh, we're just seeing sort of the aliasing effect of the screen door. I'm gonna go to another slice that doesn't have that. So we can hit the play button and see over and over the effect of our macro. So this is saved. It's gonna be in this drop down list. It'll always appear until you delete it. If you want to change the name, so if we want to change the name and we want to call this lesson 30 script runner demo, then it is now in the list under that name. Now, 
We can save other scripts, as I noted. So there's one in here called vector field. And when I go to it, I can just run this vector field because I want it, maybe I want to do some experiments where I create a vector field and I test different operations. So this just instantiates and creates a vector field, which is an object we haven't even talked about in the first 30 lessons of Dragonfly. But I can access this vector field and visualize it in 3D. So if you have a piece of code that you want to run repeatedly, you can just put it in a script runner and there it is uh, available for you to access. Now, if I go back to the script runner demo, there's something else we could do in here. I haven't talked about the output. So let's suppose I have this and I want to know what is the volume of my ROI as defined by this, this capsule. So re remember that it's clearing the ROI uh, every time we run it. So it clears the ROI and then paints. So this is now my ROI. And there is, of course, a method inside an ROI to get volume. So if I wanted to know what is the volume, I could say uh, volume equal my ROI, that would get volume, and that's going to return a volume. Now if I say result equal volume and I hit play, whoops, get volume, not enough parameters, there you go. Let's use time step zero and hit play. Now over here it says the volume of this is 1.0211 times 10 to the minus 10. So the volume command returns a value in meters. And so there it is, the volume. So anything I put in the result will appear over here. So if I had instead said uh, result equals a list and result.append volume, result.append hello script runner. And now I run, then I'm going to see uh, the volume and hello script runner. Now we don't need that and we don't need this. We'll just put in the volume. However, um, you know, seeing it in meters is one thing, but maybe I'd like to see it in some more useful units. So of course, Dragonfly has all the code for maintaining units, so you can have access to that code as well. So what I could do here is I could ask Dragonfly's preferences, what is my preferred units? And of course, preferences is defined. And what I'll need to do over here is we will, oh, I did not write down the import command. Well, uh, I do have this macro uh, pre-canned over here, uh, capsule demo, here it is. That is the preferences command I want. So I could put in here in the code, pre code preparation, uh, import preferences. Now down here, I have access to preferences. So let's drag this up a little bit so we can see my code block. So this is a volume and this is volume in meters, right? So this is volume reported in meters. Now we could say I want the volume in my preferred units. So I want it in preferred units. Now what I need to do is I need to ask the preferences for my preferred units. And uh, there's a command for that. So I can say default uh, volume units equals. And now I just need to ask preferences for get default volume unit, uh, something like that. That will return the volume unit. So uh, that's a, a, a scaling factor that says, okay, cubic microns versus uh, cubic meters. So it knows how to report it. Then if I want to say volume in preferred units, we'll try and spell it correctly. Ah, I can't spell, so we'll just leave it spelled that way. Then we could say equal default volume unit. Okay, that's the object we just defined in the previous step. And then I could ask uh, uh, to get reference unit converted to unit and I could uh, pass it in my volume. So if I call this and I ask for the get reference unit convert, uh, get uh, reference unit converted to unit, then this is sufficient to convert it back to uh, cubic microns. So this will change dramatically. And maybe we want to know what are those units. So like a text string. So if I want to know the units abbreviation. Then I could, yeah, abbreviation equals, and then I could say default volume unit dot get unit abbreviation. So now I have the volume in my preferred units and I have the unit abbreviation. So maybe I will say that this will be a string of volume and I will add the units. Uh, and maybe I'll put a space in between. So just a little bit of Python code. And now, I don't know if I've typed everything right. We can, let's see, uh, Matthew's ch chiming in to tell me what I forgot. Uh, string volume in preferred units, let's see. 
yes, what was I thinking here? This should be here. So, um, so I, I can hit the play button and it's telling me default volume unit is not fine because I mistyped it. So we'll correct that here. Default volume units, default volume units, and then <laughs> here we are. Now tomorrow we'll talk about developer tools where you actually use a proper development studio that has variable recognition and tab completion and access to all of the libraries. So that'll be a completely different and you'll have access to more rich tools, but this is just what you can do in script runner. All right, default volume unit is not defined. So that's because I put it as an S and try again. Oh, look, there it is. Uh, there it is in cubic microns. And so if I, uh, you know, make this super tiny again, we could make it interactive again. Um, that's probably not that important. But what's going to happen now is every time I drag this, it's going to, oh, I didn't click this button. Now every time I drag this, it's going to uh, update and uh, create a new volume because I have clear at execution set. If I uncheck clear at execution, basically every time I'm moving the mouse, it's executing the entire piece of code, whether I'm dragging or not. So that's why it's a little bit slow is because it's it's being triggered not when I change the capsule, but every time I drag the mouse in the user interface. So, uh, you know, we could try uh, grabbing this, making it a little wider, give it a moment, and now, uh, now it has a much bigger volume. So uh, that's, gosh, what time is it? Whoa, it's super late. We've had a long lesson. Um, that is probably enough for today. So let's go back and look at what we said. So we decided we would cover Interactive Console and then Script Runner. I will uh, just point your attention. If you ever go to Dragonfly Developer Documentation, you just type this into Google and you can land on this page. And one of the things that we did not get into today are code snippets. So there's so much here on this page. And this is going to be uh, if you're new to Python, this would be tremendously overwhelming. If you're used to using Python and use, using documented open source tools, you're going to be in good shape. There's lots of documentation here. If I go to code snippets, I could say, oh, how do I create a channel from a NumPy array? And here's a nice little example, or how do I access the NumPy array from a channel? We did that today, and oh, here's the same example, overwriting every other pixel here with the value one instead of zero. So there's lots of little code snippets here. Now, um, I don't know if script runner is documented here yet. It's a pretty new feature. But what you want to draw your attention to is ORS model. So these are all of the ORS model objects like ROIs and channels and shapes, et cetera. And so you can click on this and you can see the Python user interface. So for example, today we used a method inside channel that allowed us to overwrite with ROI. Remember that method? So if we come over here, we used to do, do, do um, my channel dot overwrite value with ROI. So you can discover all of those functions um, by going to the channel method, or sorry, the channel class. And you'll find, you know, just pages and pages and pages of documented methods. And so if I just search inside this page for overwrite, there it is, overwrite value with ROI, defines, tells you the constraints or the non-constraints, lots of great documentation here. Wow. So. Uh, a lot for you guys to think about, and uh, you can prepare your, your thoughts and questions for tomorrow's lesson, which will uh, dig into some, some more Python developer tools for helping you uh, debug and create new Python functionality and Python code inside Dragonfly. Now, let's go ahead and go to questions and answers. Um, for those of you that uh, would still like to do your homework, um, it's due tomorrow. So in one to two sentences, if you have not already described a macro you would like to see made in Macro Builder, do that for tomorrow's lesson so you can paste it in. Now, let's look and see if anyone has pasted it in to today's question and answer block. All right. Here is a one that has been put up. Uh, automatic use of histographic segmentation to deconvolve peaks on user-defined mathematical criteria. Yeah, so we could certainly... Um, uh, we might not use the histographic segmentation tool. What we might do is uh, compute our own histographic segmentation tool. That is, we might let the user take two images inside a macro and or maybe take one image and compute the Sobel function automatically, then automatically compute that array that is usually plotted in the 2D view, then process it, find the two peaks, and then maybe we could actually import that as a seed directly into histographic segmentation. So we could do something like that. Um, uh, that's it. No one else has any, any, okay. Well, let me dismiss a lot of these questions, right? That one I want to keep. We're going to, all right, dismiss, dismissing. Everyone's rejoined. Everyone had to reconnect. Uh, 
Okay, macro, automatic import with saved parameters of separate channels derived from the image stack. Yeah, Lars has said that that's not working for him because he would like to do that. So we could look at that with macro builder. So after you import one image channel and you've set the pixel size or maybe the pixel dimensions with crop parameters, repeating, um, the import image method has something like 30 parameters, but once we've defined them in the macro builder, we could reuse those same parameters repeatedly. Here's another one. Um, create a movie of a segmented bone that zooms in, turn the cortex semi-transparent, and show the internal trabecular structure. That's kind of cool. That would not be too hard. That'd be a fun little uh, specific movie maker. If you are interested in movie maker, please um, uh, please visit the the video demos I showed you yesterday. There is one for creating a macro builder that actually creates a movie. So we could do something like this, um, so that you could then reuse that on multiple bones. That'd be terrific. Um, here's another one, load an image, bin it by two by two by two, then apply upper O2 and export the binarized image. So that would be very easy to demonstrate in Macro Builder. Um, all right, here's a question. After you have set my channel equal to none, the corresponding item in data properties is still there. How do you remove it with a Python command? Matthew, if you are listening, can you see the questions and answers? I'm looking at a question that was asked at 8.19 a.m. Maybe you can type in an answer. Uh, of course, it's so late, Matthew may have had to go to his other meeting. So um, this, oh wait, here's an answer. My channel dot delete object. Well, there you go. Um, there's a good way to delete an object from the Python console. Here's a question. Um, in Script Runner, do you have auto completion and contextual help? Not yet. You'd have to use the documentation on the developer website or the Python console. Okay, that's it. Just those two questions for Script Runner. Maybe this was a little overwhelming, maybe a little bit like drinking from the fire hose. I hope that you see that there's a ton you can do and Script Runner can make you more productive than just typing directly on console because it gives you a place to store and edit your code. So um, I am going to uh, keep these questions and answers and that way we can uh, reference them again after uh, after we collect the, the votes from tomorrow's macro request. Then we can get one of these highly voted macros added to the Dragonfly, Dragonfly Daily Agenda. All right, last chance. Any more questions on the Python console or on Script Runner? Well, actually, let me just ask you a question. Can you just put it a comment in right now and the question answers if you found today's content somewhat useful and you might actually experiment with Python? Can you just put in a yes in the questions and answers? Or if you're on the fence, just say nothing. All right, yes, yes, oh, okay, look at that. All right, you guys just don't have any questions. You're still interested. Excellent, look at all those yeses. Well, that's great. We would love to have lots of contributions. We want you solving your problems. Our team is only so many people, we can't do all possible development, but you can use Dragonfly to customize your own development. You can publish papers with those customized developments and then people will say, wow, I wanna do that too. And they'll download your shared script and then cite your papers uh, even more. So absolutely, we want you to be developing for Dragonfly and creating new customizations and extensions. All right, I'm gonna to have to end today's meeting. Just a reminder, if you were interested in the graph or the bone collaborations and discussions, look for an email. Everyone who is registered for the webinar live views will be able to join uh, or will receive an email invite to those discussions. Thanks again, everyone. I hope you enjoy the content. Look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. We'll talk more about Dragonfly Python developer tools. All right, everyone, take care, be good. See you in a, see you tomorrow.